Find your seats. And uh, hey, we get the wonderful privilege from getting into the Word, the Word of God. It transforms and changes lives. And, uh, and tonight, uh, we, we get the honour of having somebody who's no stranger to GU, no, no stranger to Generation Unleashed. And in fact, I asked him before service, how, how many times have you preached at Generation Unleashed? And he said, I think 15. And so that's always a good sign when somebody forgets how many times they've preached uh, here at this conference. And so uh, we get the wonderful privilege from hearing the word from somebody that everybody wants to hear the word from. And uh, Pastor Judah Smith is so um, gracious to be here tonight. And so uh, I, I, want, I want you to have an expectation, um, not just for a great message, but I, I, I'm asking for you to have an expectation for God to deposit something in your heart, uh, in your mind. And so would you stand to your feet and uh, would you give Pastor Judas Smith the most rousing applause you've ever given? Come on. What a night. You feel good? I love you. I love you a lot. Um, thank you. Pray for me. Uh, I hate Atlanta and I hate Boston. And they're in the Super Bowl and that stinks. So I'm working through all of that right now. But uh, go who? You guys need to be dismissed, man. You guys. What is going on over here? I thought for sure we were the team of destiny, but that's okay. How about the Blazers? Okay. Tough crowd. Tough crowd. Hey, um, I love you, and I love this community, and I, I love this church. I love this city. Um, I'm so grateful for Pastor Mark Estes, his family, the leadership here, so excited about the new season and the new transition. I'm also incredibly grateful to be doing life now with Andrew and his wife and their babies. And uh, I can report that at least we're having a lot of fun. I mean, we're having a lot of fun and um, I'm watching him play basketball because I can't play anymore. But uh, I'm, I love this man very, very much, and I'm grateful for his love for Jesus and his time sowing seeds here in Portland. We are both Portland guys. And tonight, I sit down, I say hi to Mekon Carter, um, come to find out he had an old phone number for me, so he thought we weren't friends anymore. And I thought he just didn't like me anymore, so he, he never reached out. I would reach out. Like, so recently I texted him, I said, do I get to see you tomorrow? And he was this guy. He was like, I'm sorry, whose number is this? You know, he's that guy. So, no, that's cool, man, I get it. Um, but Mekon and I have known each other. This is what happens when you get old. We've known each other for like 122 years. And um, I'm so excited to be here with Mekon. I need to say that, and I love this man so much, what he's doing, um, leadership in the Yakima Valley and beyond. I was over on that side of the mountains, and I watched um, his TV show. Pastor Mark, you should see Mekon's TV show. It's so, how should I say, normal and awesome and like relatable, and it was, it was really good. I almost gave money at the end, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I was like, nah. But um, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, but so, so I sit down and, and you know, it, it's GU, right? I mean, I, I, this, is, is, this place raised me and I cannot believe that I sit next to Eric Knox. Now, you are like, oh, Eric, Eric's cool. You understand, Eric is the, my ultimate hero in life. I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating at all. So Eric Knox came to this space of the world. We lived across the street in the domes, ended up moving into our house, was trying out for the trailblazers, and he literally became everything I wanted to be in this life. I mimicked his mannerisms. I tried to wear the same clothes. I got cross colors for days. You know that's right, okay? Don't talk to me. They have no idea what we're talking about, but let's just have a moment. Um, this is un- 
unbelievable. I love you, Eric Knox. I respect you. Thank you so much for what you deposited in my life. You look so handsome and so young and so cool. You are, in fact, the coolest person in this room, and I love you, and thank you for being a hero to me. Can we tell Eric Knox one more time that we love him? <clears throat> holla! Turn to your neighbor and say, holla at your boy. Go get you a bracelet, okay? Get 10 bracelets. Let's do it big. Deal? Are you excited? Um, I really feel like um, the scripture I'm going to share with you and, and the part of the Bible narrative we're going to look at can really help you. And it can help you now and it can help you for the rest of your life. And so I think it's apropos and applicable to your season of life, seeing that most of you obviously are young people. This is a youth conference. But I think this is um, a, a passage of scripture that will serve you well if you'll revisit it and kind of recall it. And remember it. So I want to go to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to read this together. And we're going to kind of see what happens. Now, um, if you're new to this space and new to GU and, and, um, and you're like, what's going on? And your youth pastor tricked you or your mom forced you or your grandma paid for you. And so you're here and you're like, what's going on? Um, this is a gathering of um, a, a lot of people who believe in this idea of following Jesus. And so we believe that Jesus not only forgives us of our error, wrong, and our sin, that we're absolutely forgiven. And now we can have right relationship with the one that gave us breath in the first place place, but we actually believe that our lives now on a daily basis are dedicated to one primary idea, and that is that we could follow Jesus every day. That literally, like these original 12 guys, which we're going to look at tonight, who for approximately three and a half years followed Jesus around a desert, and they experienced some extraordinary, excruciating, exciting, exhilarating moments with Jesus, that we're now a part of that legacy, and we are now a part of the original 12, has now become billions around the world, and we actually believe in following Jesus. So what you're going to experience tonight is a talk that I'm going to try to do from the Bible, which we believe um, is 66 books written by approximately 44 different authors in about 1,600 years, but we believe that actually it's one primary author, which is God, who used 44 different people to compile this supernatural book that cannot be defeated and removed from the face of the planet. So we actually believe that when we read it, 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 it's the story of God, and we believe that this is the story of God. It's not a collection of morals and concepts and ideas and, and precepts and, 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 and how to be a good American, but what's in this is, is, is the idea that we're, we're, we're going to follow Jesus, and whether you're aware of it or not, you are now living in within the story of God. The big idea of the cosmos and the universe is that you're in the story of God, whether you know it right now. You, you, you think it's your story, and you think it's like your middle school story or your high school story, but actually it's God's story. It's the story of God, and you play a part in that story. He gave you breath for purpose and reason to add to his story and the glory of his story, but you have to understand that trees and hills and, and, and rhinoceroses, is that a plural, and, 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 and dolphins, who knew we were going to mention dolphins this quick in the sermon? You know what I mean? Like it's going to be a good night when dolphins, we're already to dolphins in like six minutes. It's a good sign. Dolphin, that like all of creation knows this is God's story and it's being played out in real time. And so when you read this book, we are now in the continuation of that story. And what happened here is, though it's different culturally, it's different in time and space, it is essentially the same. So, so Jesus remains on the earth. We remain walking with him. And his mandate and mission remains the same, to tell everyone that he has arrived and he is here to completely transform the human experience, that our life's going to be changed. So we're going to enter to a story. Remember, the Bible is not a textbook, it's a storybook. And it's to be read in story form. It is, in fact, a narrative. So we're going to enter the narrative, and by entering this narrative, we're going to understand the narrative that we find ourselves in 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 2017, and it is a peculiar narrative if you've been watching the news lately. Here we are in the western part of the world, but yet we're in the story of God. Matthew chapter 18, are you still with me? I could say dolphins again to pique your curiosity. Matthew 18, 
And at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the middle of them, right in front of them, and he said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, now fast forward with me to Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, and if you don't go there, I think we'll put it up on the Sky Bible. Mark chapter 9. I don't know. You can call it whatever you want. I call it a Sky Bible. Everyone just relax. Mark <laughs> chapter 9. Okay, 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 okay. Same, listen, same scene. Same scene. Same scene. Different vantage point. Okay? Same moment. One's recorded by Matthew the tax collector. This is same scene recorded by Peter, which he told to Mark, who who scribed it and, and, and recorded it. And it says this now, and they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, Jesus asked, hey, hey, what were you guys talking about on, on the way here? And, and the guys, the 12, were like, nothing, we, we, nothing. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the 12, and he said, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And here it is, he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Now go to Luke, Luke chapter 9. Are, are you, you okay? Okay. Luke chapter 9, same scene, new vantage point. Okay, so you got Matthew the tax collector, you got Peter's side of the story as told to Mark, and now you have Dr. Luke, okay? He says, now an argument arose among them as to which was the greatest, but Jesus, knowing the reason of their hearts, took a child, put him by his side, and said to him, whoever receives a child in my name receives me, whoever receives me receives him who sent me, for he who is least among you all is the one who is great. I want to talk to you. Um, the title of the talk, Great Like a Child, Great Like a Child. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the moments that we share. Uh, so much has been sung, so much has been said. Add whatever you want to add, but in all of this, may we see you, may we experience you, and as Dylan said, may we encounter you. And we thank you for your grace. God, I'm asking that somehow the Falcons and the Patriots could just tie, and no one could win and that you'd help the Seahawks win next year. In Jesus' name, and everybody said. Amen. Amen. So grateful for Dylan's leadership, already doing such a phenomenal job. I cannot locate him in the crowd, so I would just keep scanning. But there he is. Love you guys, you're doing a great job, fantastic. Very first GU that you're leading. You're, 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 you're definitely good looking, and that's an advantage. That's an advantage. That's an advantage. Well, it's the first of the year, right? So we just started uh, 2017. And I don't know what the first of the year is like for you. Um, you, you know, maybe at your age, you, you don't need to consider uh, resolutions. Now, and I grew up in a church where dad didn't believe in resolutions. He's like, we don't believe in New Year's resolutions. We believe in being led by the Holy Spirit. So, so I don't know what we believe anymore about resolutions, but I got a lot of friends who have them, okay? And they're like, man, my resolution is I'm going to lose the extra weight. I'm going to, and, and about this time of year, every time the new year comes around in my adult life, I get insecure, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to stand up here on my 100th GU and lie to you. I get insecure. I'm not that guy. Like, if you're looking for a type A, driven, goal-oriented, high-powered, high-octane, motivated person, it's not me. If you let me, I would still watch, watch Fresh Prince of Bel-Air all day long. You're cheering because there's reruns. I live when, like, next week was a new episode. So don't act like you know what Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is. I'm talking Saved by the Bell. Holler at your boy if you know what I'm talking about. So I could watch Sports Center all day. And I'm not like my wife. My wife would be like, oh, I need to do something. I'm like, we are doing something. And I like it. Like, Chelsea who I've been married to for 17 years. Chelsea gets up every morning. It's so annoying. And she gets out her Bible, and she reads for like an hour, 
And then I'm like, are you done yet? And she like reads for another hour. So every once in a while, I'll be like, I'm going to try to read as long as she reads. Every single time without fail, I'm like, this is ridiculous. Let's go, let's go, let's go watch SportsCenter. Who, what are, are you possibly reading for that long in the Bible? And she reads like Old Testament books and stuff. And I'm just like, I can't do this. Like, I'm like, I'm a pastor, but I'm like a verse a day guy. You know what I'm talking about? Bible at me, please. Give me a verse a day. I'll think about it all day. Right? So the problem with being a pastor is all my pastor friends come around January, all their churches are fasting and praying. Everybody I talk to, we're on a fast and prayer. And I was like, well... In Seattle and L.A., what we're doing, come to think of it, I've been fasting hockey for 20 years, for instance. I haven't played with Legos for like 15 years. Right? Like, I, I've been, I never measure up. That's just, I, I always, you know, like, the other day I'm talking to a buddy and he's like, man, you know what I'm doing for the new year? And I'm like, here it goes, here it goes. He's like, for 30 days, man, this really happened. For 30, he's in my living room. For 30 days, I'm doing, I'm doing just fresh lemon juice, cayenne pepper, <laughs> alkaline water, and agave. Agave didn't exist, by the way, like 12 years ago. We didn't even know what that was. He, he said, for 30 days, and I'm going to lose a pound a day. And I was like, dang. I was thinking about not doing chips and guacamole till like Thursday. <laughs> For the Lord, though, you know what I mean? Like, Lord, I'm going to take that same time I'll be killing those chips, and I'm going to talk to you. I don't, I don't know what it is. Like, I set goals, and I feel trapped. Do you feel like me? Like, like Chelsea will be like, what do you want to do this year for God? And I'm like, I just want to follow him. You can't put these expectations on me, right? I can't live up to this. I feel like my creativity is suffocated with all of your type A driven goal oriented living. I can't do it. I just want to just, just follow Jesus. You know what I'm talking about? I just want to be led by the Spirit. I love to be spontaneous. I just, like I find scriptures to prove that like, like, like Jesus me, wants all of us to be spontaneous. Like, I'm that guy, you know? Like, because I, I feel insecure when I run in to people who do so much in their day. You know what's crazy? Like, I'm 38 years old. When Eric Knox lived with us, I was 11, 12, and boy, I had some insecurities. But if anybody gets up on this stage and tells you, the older you get, those insecurities will fade, they might be lying to you. Sometimes they get worse. And it, it, but then it's a problem because you're in a grown adult and you're like, well, well you know, and you start, you start making stuff up that you know you don't do. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you're like, you're like well, I'm, I, I read my Bible an hour a day, and you're like, well, I've, shh, whew, I'm going to memorize a whole book this year. And you're like, no, I'm not, but I'm going to say it. You know, like... We lie, you know. Comparison. What is it about comparison? Now, they tell us statistically, they tell us categorically, they tell us emotionally or psychologically that you, you as students, you deal with an acute amount of insecurity. I don't know if I buy into that. I think we all deal with not measuring up. We all deal with, am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Am I fast enough? Am I old enough? Am I young enough? Am, am I educated enough? Do I look the right way? Do I talk the right way? Do people like me? And now, now we got platforms where we can keep score on our social status. Now we all live with mobile scoreboards. And, 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 and on a given day, your emotions can skyrocket and plummet. I mean, we are living in unprecedented days in relationship to our social status, well-being, identity, and sense of worth. So here's the big idea tonight. 
Do you ever feel insecure? Just look straight ahead. Don't act all fidgety because that will give it away. <laughs> Just look at your neighbor and say, this is good, man. Just you. Listen to this. This is good. This is good for you. Youth pastors, tell your young people, this is good, guys. That's why, that's why I brought you here. This is good. This is good. <laughs> Do you ever have those normal emotions? I love the story that we read tonight because we can demonize these 12 dudes who are incredibly average, who follow Jesus around for approximately three and a half years, or we can recognize that we are a lot alike the 12 and us. I'll tell you what they're doing. They're doing what a lot of us do, whether we do it verbally and overtly or whether we do it covertly and inwardly, but we all do it. Who's the best? Wait a minute. Like, am I the only one when you talk to somebody who's really struggling and inside there's that little like, ding, ding. <laughs> uh, I am totally better than them. Uh, oh man, tough, uh, ugh, I'm so sorry, really? Wow, that's got to be difficult. Your life's a nightmare. <laughs> oh, man, at least I'm not that guy. Have you ever been encouraged by people's deficiency? You ever been encouraged? How sadistic are we? Right? Man, my, my girl broke up with me. <laughs> oh, man, gosh. I'm so sorry, man. Wow. All of a sudden, your singleness just feels better. What's wrong with us? But it's real, isn't it? We read stories like this and we're like, can you believe these 12 guys walking around with Jesus talking about where do I rank? Why don't you focus on the Lord? No, oh, they're, they're just like you and me. Just like you and me. We're supposed to follow Jesus too, but we find ourselves often, in fact, probably every day, Wondering if we're better than him, a little better than her. Well, at least I'm cuter. Well, at least I'm fitter. Well, at least I'm going to pass high school, so. <laughs> so, at least I love God, right? Like we have these little, we don't tell anybody. Sometimes we do. Do you know how destructive that is to your human experience? Do you know how much life that's robbing you from? Do you know how much you're missing in your brief stay here on earth, busy with everybody else's life and status and forgotten that God has called you to be you? Who? Jesus, Matthew says. Jesus says, they say, Jesus, who? is the greatest. Now that's interesting because Matthew, the tax collector, who writes primarily to a Jewish audience in the Synoptic Gospels, he says the disciples asked. Now fast forward to Mark, as recorded, he records Peter's side of the story, and he says that the disciples didn't ask who's the greatest, they avoided that Jesus picked up on the fact that they talked about it. Isn't it funny? Matthew says they just asked. Peter says they were like, nah, we didn't say, nah, we weren't talking about nothing. We weren't talking about nothing. And Luke says they argued. Now, see, people about this time, when you do your research in the Bible, they're like, see, see, the Bible's inconsistent. That's what's the problem. That's what's the problem with this old book. It's, it's not, you see, these stories are all mixed up. No, 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 no. God gave Matthew the assignment of the Jews. He gave Peter an assignment to encourage people who were avoiders and also just, just emotionally disturbed people and unstable people like me. Mark's definitely gonna be your gospel, okay? Comes from a vantage point of an emotionally unstable disciple who talked a lot, so that's your gospel. And Dr. Luke writes in street Greek for everybody who doesn't have the history of Israel and the Torah and Judaism. So God assigns these three guys to talk to three different kinds of people. So Matthew says to the Jews, the 12 guys just ask, who's the greatest? That's, that's a very much a Jewish approach. Okay, are you the Messiah? Who's the greatest? They, they want, they just, they're direct. Peter is like, man, we avoided it, man. Jesus caught us and we were like, I don't, I don't know. And, and Luke is like, they just argued. Luke's writing to Greeks. Guess what Greeks do? They argue. 
Like, this is, and you know what's crazy? Three giveaways of people who struggle with comparison, competition, and measuring themselves by themselves. Three giveaways socially. You give yourself away. And it's right here. God put it in the scriptures. The synoptic gospels tell us. And it, it's these people. First of all, there's direct people. You gotta love these people. They're amazing. Hey, I thought we were best friends. Honestly, you're never there for me. I can take my time elsewhere, but you say we're best friends. You never return my call. You never like my photos. Um, actually, you don't even follow me on Instagram. Seriously? Oh, did you know I was on Snapchat? No, you didn't know. Okay, so anyways. Um, <laughs> seriously? So are we best friends? Yes or no? Am I your best friend? Because you say I'm your best friend, and honestly, you hang out with her all the time. And I'm just, I'm, I'm just sick of it, honestly. I can't. There's no reciprocation. So are we? So I, something tells me you're a little insecure. Now, there's another, there's another telltale sign, isn't there? Right? And that's the one that's the avoider. Hey, man, sorry. So sorry I didn't call you back. That's fine. I don't need you to call me, bro. I'm good, dude. I don't need you, bro. You think I'm waiting around for your call? You think I need your call? Player, please, man. I don't need you. Man, me and God, we're good, bro. So you just, uh, cool, whenever. Like, I don't care. It's not like I waited around for you. It's not like I was going to meet you at the gym. We were going to play ball and you didn't show up. I, I, that didn't happen. It didn't matter to me. I don't even need you as a friend. I'm good. I love people who constantly are telling other people, I don't care what people think. Do you know the psychology of that? The more you say it, we all look at each other and go, psychology tells us that's called deflection. And you actually crave approval and the feeling to measure up. So that's why you got to walk around and go, I don't even care, man. You know what, bro? Hey, whoa, dude, crazy shirt. You think I care? <laughs> I don't care, man. I don't wear shirts for you. I wear shirts for me, bro. Oh, okay. All right. You grown, man. Yeah, that's right. Good, man. Okay. Hint, hint. The more you say it, and the more you tell us you don't need us, the more we know you struggle with the same stuff we struggle with. There's askers, so are we. There's avoiders, I don't need you. And there's arguers. There's arguers. Oh, so, so, my dad, yeah, makes a lot more money than your dad. So, <laughs> it doesn't matter. You think I care? Oh my gosh, look at you. How about work out? I don't have to work out. You imagine when you get older, ugh. I love people in church. I can't believe you said that in church. Everyone calm down collectively. But this is real life, man. These guys are dealing with emotions we all deal with. Do I measure up? Do I, am I going to get ahead? Success is an interesting topic, isn't it? We're not careful, man. We, we, we come together as communities of faith, and we start peddling to success, not defined by Scripture and the story of God, but defined by our cultural context. And now success is completely diminished to something as arbitrary and temporary as the amount of money some employer gives you every month. Where is that one in the Bible again? Now all of a sudden we're like, well, you know, you know how many followers I got. In fact, I got an offer. They're going to pay me to do some subtle ads on my Insta story. So probably going to make like 500 a month. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. Like if, if we're going to get together, we might as well talk about stuff that really affects our life. You going to spend the rest of your life keeping up with the Joneses, as they say? Spend the rest of your life pursuing? I'm going to tell you the truth, okay? Here's one of the worst things that might happen to your human experience. You'll set goals and wait for it, and you might reach them. And then people are going to be like, what, what do you feel like, man? Is it awesome? And, and it, it'll, here's the classic response right after the Super Bowl or any other bowl, okay? Well, but um, they, they, they literally say, man, I can't, I, don't, I can't even, 
I can't even put it into words, man. It's crazy. Crazy. <laughs> Empty. Be careful now. Be careful what you wish for. What is life for? What are we here for? What is, what's it all about? Are we going to be who God's made us to be and enjoy the life he has prepared for us? I want to show you something that God showed me I've never seen before. And I was just dealing with this, and I'm a dad now, man. I got a 12-year-old, I got a 10-year-old, and I got a 9-year-old, okay? And, and the 12-year-old is obsessed. He wants his own fashion line. He loves Jesus and everything, but he wants to look good while he follows Jesus. And so he wants a fashion line, L Dog, L Dizzle, okay? He's, he's bigger than the 12-year-old, and he might be my retirement. You know what I'm talking about? If we get him in linebacker position or something, then in Gray Ray, my favorite of the three, the little girl, she's uh, it's a joke. Relax, okay? She kind of, she is my little girl and daddy's girl. But, but, man, I look at my babies all the time, and how, how do I raise them and prepare them for real life? The truth about following Jesus. Just having one of those moments, you know, like, God, how are we going to, find stability and security and identity. And we talk about this stuff at conferences. Come on, man. I, I lived across the street. I, I, we, I've, been, I've been to more conferences than you've been to Chick-fil-A or Dairy Queen or Taco Bell or whatever horrific place you go to eat. Um, but I want to experience the identity that Jesus says we can have. So he responds in an unorthodox way. The guys ask, they avoid, and they argue. And here's what Jesus does. He finds a little boy. We don't know exactly his age, but we know it's a boy. The scripture says him, put him. And he puts a little boy in front of the 12 slightly older boys. And he says, um, so you want to talk where you rank, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoever becomes like this boy in terms of your posture and mentality, teachability, receptivity, humility. You, I call that great. I call that great. Now, 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 now all 12 guys suck air, no question. They're like, oh, what? Because kids in antiquity were non-people. They weren't even counted. They couldn't contribute. They couldn't vote. Literally in those days, you heard that term, you know, kids should be seen and not heard. In ancient times, kids should be not seen or heard. Seriously. I mean, that's really how they rolled. So Jesus brings a non-person in front of them and says, um, I want you to be like a non-person, and I want you to love non-people. Don't get me started about non-people, because non-people totally depends on your context. Who were you taught not to see? Who do you not see? Who do you count as a non-person? You don't even know they're the non-person. You don't even see them. You don't even know why you don't see them, but you just don't. They're just a non-person. They're peripheral. They're, they're not important. They're not the people you say hello to. They're not the people you ask their story of. You're not the people you say, what's your name? You don't. They just serve you at a restaurant. It's a non-person. I, I don't have to engage with you because you're a non, contextually, you're a non-person. Jesus raged against that mentality and said, we've got to go after non-people and love non-people and look after non-people and accept non-people. That's not the sermon tonight, but it's free. I want us to watch how Jesus interacts with this boy because Matthew's going to tell us one interaction. Peter, through Mark, is going to tell us another interaction. And Luke's going to tell us another interaction. Keeping in mind, you are the disciples in this story, and you are supposed to be like the child. So you are simultaneously in the story right now. You are the disciples and the child. And in the story, Jesus is still Jesus. Okay? Bible jokes. Okay. We're going to keep moving here. Look what Matthew says. You can read it later or you can look at your Bible. Matthew 18, verses 1 to 5. He says, and Jesus called the child to him. You're about to see three things that if you will take them literal and you will accept them, 
receive them, believe them, mull them over, rehearse them, revisit them, recall them, and talk about them, and mutter them, and which mutter means to talk to yourself about it. If you'll do that, you will be able to realize what Jesus is about to give us a portrait of. It says, the fr first, Matthew says, he called the child. Now you'll notice, Mark and Luke say nothing of calling the child. But Matthew wants us to know that the child was chosen. The child was picked. Were there other children around? Possibly. That's a fair expansion of the text. Probably. The probability is likely. But he chose that one and called the child. So Matthew wants me to know that I'm called to be like the child. And like this child, Jesus has called me. Now, the disciples might not be picking up what Jesus is laying down, but they're supposed to because the picture and the portrait is on purpose. He calls the child, and then he says, I want you to be like. No, no, no. Now, Mark's not going to say nothing about call, but you know what Mark's going to say? You can look at it for yourself. It says, and, and Jesus brought the child, and he says, putting the child in front of them, watch this. Mark says, Jesus picked the child up, up in his arms. He picked him up. Isn't that crazy? Matthew says nothing about picking up the baby, picking up the little boy. But, but don't get me started because I wonder if Peter saw the boy in Jesus. He, he, what, what stuck in Peter's mind is that Jesus held the child. Because if you had gone through what Peter had gone through, you would probably pick up and notice the fact when Jesus embraces the kid. Because do you know what avoiders need? A hug. That's what avoiders need. You just need a hug. This was my dad. This is classic dad. I would fight with my sister. She was a dictator. And we would fight. And the dad would make us, will you forgive me, right? And then we would have to kiss. Welcome to my life, bro. Oh, I have it so bad, I have to have time out. I wish I could get some time out back in the 80s, please. I couldn't walk for weeks, man, okay? So we, we would kiss, but then there was leftovers. You know what I'm talking about? Y'all would be like, uh. I'm still mad, I'm still ugly, I'm still mean, I'm still like, bye, whatever, ugh, right? And then dad would be like, son, come here. I'd be like, dad, I'm fine. Dad, seriously, I'm fine. Just dad, just give me some space. Come here, son, come here. We're walking around the kitchen, I'm like, dad, I'm fine. I'm 17, dad, please don't do this. Please, dad. That wasn't supposed to be a joke. Please, dad. And what, he would find me, put his arms around me, and he would break me. You know what I'm talking about? Dad, please. Dad, dad, okay, dad, come on. <laughs> okay, all right, I'm fine. I love you, son. I love you, dad. I love you, too. Give me a kiss. Okay, on my lips. Dad. <laughs> Welcome to my life. Like, literally, that's, that was my, but you know, that's what God does, too, sometimes. I'm going to hug you. Until you let me. He says, Peter, that kind of scared me. I'm not going to lie. I'm not, I'm not going to stand up here and be like, I, I, I'm cool. I'm going to be all right. <laughs> I was like, Eric, <laughs> we got to go. <laughs> Woo. Appreciate you, man. Um, you guys awake like me now? Okay. So. <laughs> so. I'm going to tell Chelsea about you later. That was cool. That was good. That was good. How was tonight? Well, I thought I was about to die. I'm going to tell you that right now. So, <laughs> woo! So Matthew says the child's called. Peter says the child's held. And look at what Luke saw. Isn't it crazy how we all see what we need to see in Jesus when we need to see it? Luke, Luke says, you, you can look at it for yourself. It's Luke 9, Mark 9, Matthew 18. Luke says, and he put the child by his side. I don't have time to tell you what it means to be called in the Bible story, what it means to be in his arms, and what arms are indicative of in the story of God, and what the side of God means. But I think Jesus is saying, I want you to accept what I'm doing for you 
and with you and in you like a child. I, hey guys, I picked you, man. I could have picked anybody, but I picked you. And I got you in my arms. You guys are, you're a hot mess, but I got you in my arms. And I know you're troubled and I know you got stuff, but I like you. You're in my arms. Oh, and you're by my side. So, so you're valued because God picked you out of the pack. God chose you. You, you have provision. <laughs> And you have love and care because you're, you're in his arms. Now, this makes for good preaching. Like, I understand that. And I could get the piano going and I could raise my voice and we could, we could do some shouting. You know what I'm talking about? And, and, but I want you to really accept this for a second and consider whether or not you actually believe what I'm saying about Jesus. That he has called you. Now, some of you are like, man, I don't even believe in God, but I'm going to go out on a limb and tell you that the fact that you're in this room means that God is hot on your trail, kind of whether you like it or not. It's like not an accident that you're in this Jesus environment. <laughs> Just in case if you're wondering, like, is God really, like, he, he probably chose you, man. That's probably why you're here. And then he wants to hold you and never let go. And then, I love this part, and I'm done, and I'm, 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 I'm done. He's going to put you by his side. He's going to put you by his side. I realize a lot of people in this room didn't have a dad. Maybe even didn't have a, a father figure. And I believe with all of my heart that ultimately you can experience the love and affection from your heavenly father. I had for 60 years a father figure. A father that was my hero. And there's nothing like in your childhood when you can stand next to dad, and you could be like, well, good. You know what I mean? Like, I'm with dad. Nothing's going to happen. I'm with, I'm with dad. Coolest part about being a dad, like, my kids don't know that I'm really not that big. Do you know what I mean? Like, they, it hasn't dawned on them, like, dad, you're kind of skinny, to be honest. You know, like, <laughs> at least a seven-year-old can't tell, you know. But she, she stands next to dad, and she really believes in the deepest part of her being, that all is well. Because dad's here. It's my privilege to have her at my side. You are at the side of Jesus. You know what that means? He's going to walk with you every day. Now I looked at these three scenes and I said, God, I need to, I want to experience this. And I felt like one, just one, one last practical takeaway and, and someone can come play the piano. So that this gets super, super spiritual. But um, <laughs> you know, you're young and, and you're sitting in this room and I love that you're young. I think it's awesome, by the way. I love young people. I think you're amazing. I think you're so cool. I think you're so fun. Don't wish your youth away. Serve God, love God, love people, love life. Get some hobbies, see some good movies. Enjoy yourself, enjoy your youth. But don't miss the opportunity you have to walk with Jesus every day. Proverbs 69 is a super interesting proverb and it speaks volumes to me and I'm pretty sure Solomon wrote it. And he says this, and it's this interesting juxtaposition. He says, he says, man seems to plan his way a lot. This is so indicative of young people. I know what this is like. You start making big plans, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, we perpetuate it in our culture because you know what? We ask people, man, what do you want to be when you grow up, bro? What do you want to be? And you start making plans of grandeur. Go ahead. Go ahead. Make plans. That's a beautiful privilege you have to make plans, to, to be in a place where you can even dream is a gift from God. The Bible says man plans his way. But you know what Solomon says about God? You know what God seems to be focused on? Establishing your next step. And I read that from Luke and I thought, he put that child by his side. That's God's plan for all of us when it comes. And what he wants to do is he wants to take the next step with you. That's all. Do you know how many conferences like this I've been in, man? And I want to say that there's greatness in you and I want to say that you can do great things, but you listen to me. Don't get too frustrated. 
because you're going to make your plans. And you know what? More often than not, do you know what God's response to your plan is? That's cool. I like you. You're my God. How about you and me? Take just the next step. That's all. Don't busy yourself with everybody else's ideas of grandeur or what appears to be their filtered, perfect, little Insta story life. Don't spend another day in your life wishing your next step away. I know steps aren't sexy. Plans are awesome, aren't they? But you know what probably God wants to do with you? Is just say, hey, hey, don't get overwhelmed. Don't, don't get all caught up. I got to be this and do this and go. Just, hey, enjoy the next step. What is that for you? What's the next step? You know what it could be, man? It's going home and saying, Dad, I love you. I know you divorced mom, but I want you to know I still respect you. It hurts, but I love you. I hope you do write the code for the next Facebook or whatever we're gonna call it. I hope you do. But it could be that what Jesus wants to do is fill your heart with affection and forgiveness for your dad who hurt you so bad two years ago, man. And maybe you came to this event trying to forget your dad, trying to forget your mom and your dad, how they let you down. I'm just gonna go with God, I don't need my mom and dad. And here we are, and what Jesus wants to do is say, hey, can I help you with just the next step? Oh, you're gonna change the world, that's awesome, but just, Come on now. I'm going to take the next step. Hey, Dad, can I? I know you moved away. And you live in Tucson now, but can I? You got a couple minutes to talk. Yeah, well, what's going on? Your mom got you up to. No, Dad, it's not like that. I, I just want you to know I said some things I don't mean, and I really want to follow Jesus. And I just want to say I love you. And, I forgive you. Well, I, I didn't ask for your forgiveness. I know, Dad. I know. It's, it's okay. I, but I just want you to know that I, I still love you. And, and I don't understand everything that went on, but you're still my dad. Well, okay, well, well, thanks for the call. Sure, Dad. Maybe that's it. And you'll never know what that forgiveness towards your dad will do for you for the rest of your days. Maybe that's the next step. So come on, young people. Don't let people rob you of the joy and the significance and the friendship you can experience with your Jesus by taking the next step. Why? Because he chose you. He's got a hold of you. And you're by his side. Come on, you are who you are by the grace of God, by the grace of God. Your next step is waiting, your next step, and then it'll be the next step. And before you know it, you'll learn to enjoy the moment you're in and the one day you do have and the people you're with. And before you know it, you might even be able to experience life in all its fullness. Jesus came that we might have life and life in surplus. Not to lose the true meaning of being a human and being alive in Jesus Christ. Would you close your eyes for a moment? Let me pray for you. God, there's big plans in this room and I know you think those are so cool and you're proud of all the plans that students are making in this room. Plans to love you and do big things for you. But I'm asking by the help of the Spirit of Jesus that you would help us to lean into, enjoy, and relish the next step. Whatever that is in following Jesus. Help us, Lord. 
I pray right now in this moment, and I don't know how you do this, and I don't know how it works, but I'm just going to pray it right out for everybody in this room to hear. I pray that the fact that you have chosen us and that we're in your arms and we're by your side would actually become as real to us as the breath we breathe. Help us, Lord. Help us to find contentment, to find confidence, to find security and identity in you, Jesus. If you're here with every head bowed and every eye closed because the decision I'm about to ask you to make starts with, first of all, you and God. And you say, Judah, I would like to accept the free gift that only Jesus offers. It's a free gift of forgiveness. Only Jesus offers forgiveness in the universe. Only Jesus. What is it forgiveness for? It's for your wrong, your error, and your sin. And the Bible says everybody has done it. The Bible declares whosoever, wherever, Whenever, whosoever believe, to believe is to receive. Whoever receives and accepts the free gift of forgiveness that only Jesus offers will be saved forever and ever without end. And your error and your wrong and your sin, past, present, and future, will be forgiven forever, and you will have right relationship with your Creator without end into eternity. If you want that gift, you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that He is the only one, who came, the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form, and you believe that Jesus is your hero and your savior, and you want to commit the rest of your days to follow wherever he leads and experience life in all of its surplus, I'm going to ask you to respond in these moments right now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand and put it right back down. And the reason I ask you to lift your hand is because I truly believe when you respond on the outside to what's truly happened on the inside, it becomes all the more real to you. So you know who you are in this room. On the count of three, you lift up your hand, you can put it right back down. But that hand is going to matter to you because it's going to, you're going to physically move in this moment and go, that's right, what's happening on the inside is real. It is real. It is real and I accept him, and I believe him, and I'm gonna follow him. You know who you are. One, God loves you. Two, I'm definitely the guy who thinks your life will be completely transformed. Three, if that's you, would you lift up your hand all over the room? So I mean, I just, I receive, I receive. Hands all over, I receive. So Jesus, I thank you right now in this room, in Portland, Oregon, you don't just see hands tonight, you see hearts. You see us in the deepest part of our being, and I thank you in this moment of faith, we are forgiven forever. We thank you for your grace and your forgiveness that flows freely in this space. And we thank you that we're yours, chosen, held, and by your side for the rest of our days on earth and into eternity. We celebrate your miraculous, transformative power working right now. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Now together, if you're physically able, would you stand to your feet? And I think in a moment, these lyrics are going to come up on a screen. And we're going to use music as a platform to connect with our great God and tell Jesus how much we love him. Come on, young people. Let's worship him together.